Well, I pray you had a great Christmas. It is good to uh, have you here this morning. I want to thank Pastor Steve for the opportunity to share this morning. Um, I don't know that Tammy and I have ever been more excited about a new year. Are you, you wonder why? Well, for those of you who haven't heard, we're going to become grandparents this year. So 2022 can't get here fast enough for us. And this morning, my hope is to just kind of tee up the new year for you. You know, speaking of children, um, God has used kids in my life to teach me a lot about himself. I don't know if that's been true for you or not, but when my family was a little bit younger, one day we were going outside to play baseball, and uh, on the way outside, I asked my son, I said, Andrew, I said, who do you think is going to win today? And he looked back up at me, and he said, me? And I'm like, why are you so confident? He says, Dad, he says, I win every time. And that was true. So I started to think, you know, maybe it's time to kind of pull back the veil and let him see reality a little more clearly. So I said, son, who do you think is really the better baseball player, you or me? And he says, dad, he says, I beat you every time. And so that was it. It was time to kind of pull back the veil and, and, and show him uh, who his dad was. So I asked him, I said, Andrew, do you think that your dad could hit the ball over the fence in our backyard? Now, we live in a subdivision, so the yard's not that big. <laughs> and uh, he shrugs his shoulders and said, you never have. And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, do you think dad could not only hit the ball over the fence, but over the house beyond the fence? He said, no way. So I said, all right, Andrew, step out into the middle of the yard and pitch me the ball. So my, my seven-year-old son pitches me the ball, and by God's grace, I did not hit a ground ball. But that ball took off, and it soared over the fence beyond the house and out of sight. And there's my seven-year-old son just standing in the middle of our backyard with his jaw down around his waist and just going, wow. And so later that night, I was talking to Tammy. Telling, him, telling her the story and as, if it, as if God sat down with us and kind of whispered in our ear, it says, you know, how often do you see me the same way Andrew saw you? Not able to do anything more than what you've seen me do. And so starting to feel a little convicted and then God says this, he said, do you want me to wow you? Do you want me to wow you? I believe that's the invitation God gives us each new year, actually each new day, that God wants us to see him new and fresh every day, to begin to, to recognize the full power and promise that we walk in in him. And as long as we've walked with him, there's more for us to learn and discover about his goodness, his grace, his power, what he wants to do in the world to make this a better place, to have it resemble more of heaven. And so my hope this year is that each of us will invite God to wow us, to just astonish us with his goodness, with his truth, transforming us in ways that we can't even imagine possible. God wants to take us from the messy, mundane existence that far too many of us live into the miraculous into the supernatural, into a walk that allows the fruit of the Spirit to flow from us each and every day where the priceless things, the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the kindness, the self-control that we all long for are experienced in our lives. That's God's hope for you this year. So how do we get there? But well, before we open our text and look at the three ways that God wants to wow us, let's just pause and pray once again and ask God to really be our teacher this morning. So, Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you have come and, and taken up residence in our hearts, Lord. We thank you that you are such a great God, that no matter how big we imagine you to be, Lord, you are beyond that. Lord, thank you that you have said that you're able to do more than we can ask or imagine. 
So, Lord, today I pray that you would prepare us, Lord, for the year that you have for us. God, that you would excite us about the journey that's in front of us. Lord, that we wouldn't be overwhelmed by the circumstances uh, that we live with each and every day, Lord, but we would realize that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So, Lord, today plant seeds in each of our hearts that will bear fruit, not just this day, but, Lord, each and every day as we walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 21. The Word of God says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he has made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This morning, God wants to, to wow us in three different ways. And the first is this, is he wants us to recognize the miracle of the new creation that we are. God wants you to walk in a miraculous way with him each and every day. Verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. In Christ, you have been made brand new. You are a new creation. You are righteous. You are perfect. You are pleasing to God in every way in your true self. Jesus spoke of this transformation when he was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. This is what Jesus had to say. He said, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. If you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work for you, Jesus says you've been born again, that you're a new creation, that your old man has passed away and a new has come. You are a child of God. You are part of the family of God. All of your sin, all of your shortcomings were placed on Christ at the cross. This is what verse 21 speak of, speaks of. It says, for our sake, he made him to be sin for us. He took our sin on him and then put his righteousness on us. So we are now perfect. So let me ask you, if this is true, why do we struggle so much with sin still? Why are our longings still so uh, skewed? from God's revelation and path for us. What has happened is this. It's oftentimes we still see ourselves more as in, our, in our broken state than our blessed state. We understand and know our old self far better than we know our new self. We still see ourselves as sinners because we sin. But here's the reality. We are no longer sinners. The old has passed. We are now saints who sin. So, so what is the difference? Well, the difference is this. A sinner can only sin. He can be good for a while, but he can't become righteous because it's not in him. He's a sinner, and sinners sin. A saint has been freed from the power of sin and now has the choice to walk in that freedom. So while you may still sin, you are free not to sin. And that's radically different. So Satan wants to convince us because we still sin, 
we are still broken individuals. And we believe Satan's lies over, we be, over believing God's truth. We believe our broken self over our new self. Because we sin, we still see ourselves as sinners when God says you are a saint. Now, let me illustrate this. Because it's really important that we understand that it's birth that is your DNA that determines your identity, not your behavior. So let me illustrate this. Let's say that you have a dog that you love, and you spend all kinds of time training this pet to walk and talk. We have some slides. There they are. You dress your pet to look like you. You teach your pet to eat at the table. You train them to use the indoor facilities. They learn to do all kinds of things. They learn to walk on two legs. But let me ask you, does any of that make your pet more human? No. Why? They begin to look a lot like their owners. Because they're a dog. And behavior doesn't determine identity. It is your birth that does. Now hear this very quick and carefully. You can behave righteously and still be unrighteous. You can come to church. You can do all kinds of good works. And you can do everything that makes you look like a saint. But we only become a saint by birth, by trusting Christ as our personal Savior. Religion doesn't make you righteous. Now, Barna tells us this, that almost 50% of us who come to church every Sunday still haven't fully understood that truth. They are still in some way leaning into their behavior to save them. That if I'm good enough, God will make room for me. But the truth is this, it's not your behavior, but it's your birth that saves you. Unless you've been born again, unless you have put your faith in Christ, you're still an unrighteous person who may do good works, but isn't saved. So this year, the greatest gift that, that can come to you is to understand that it's not your works, it's not your behavior, but it's your birthright that makes you a part of the family of God. And then you need to start to believe the truth of who God says about you, that now you are righteous. You've been freed from the power of sin and death. You no longer have to fulfill the fleshly desires. While our true self is righteous, our bodies are still rotten. And they still create longings that are difficult for us to overcome. But God wants us to realize that as, as saints, you now fight to have your behavior match your true identity from a position of victory. So we fight not for victory, but from, from victory. Now, let me illustrate that for you. Let's say that yesterday on Christmas, somebody gave you a lottery ticket. And that turns out to actually be a winning lottery ticket. Now we've all done this, haven't we? When you start to see those lottery prizes go into the hundreds of millions of dollars, you're thinking, man, what would I do with that if I had it? So let's imagine you have the winning ticket. You read the, hear the numbers read out and you realize you are now a hundred million dollars richer. Now simply holding the ticket doesn't give you access to the resources, does it? What do you have to do to get access to the resources? Well, you have to go through a process of actually going, turning in the ticket, having it verified and validated, and then the resources are transferred to you. Now, I realize that every illustration breaks down, but in a lot of ways, that's where so many of us sit. In Christ, when we put our faith in him, you have been given righteousness. 
Jesus tells us we have everything that we need for life and godliness. It has been given to us in the person of the Holy Spirit, but so many of us have failed to be able to access the full power and the promise to see the transformation come into our life that God has promised us. And the truth is this, God has given you his spirit so that now you can have the power to possess the promises. But the promises are possessed by living through the power of the Holy Spirit aligned with the principles and precepts of God. Now, we want God just to work another miracle for us and snap a finger and have every um, fleshly desire just disappear. Now, for whatever reason, God chose not to do that. Our sanctification is a process that's worked out in partnership with him by aligning our life with his principles. Now, so many of us struggle with that because we're still trying to live the Christian life as a a solo act, as a lone ranger. We don't want to confess our sins. We don't want to acknowledge our need for others. And as a result, we're putting the lid on our capacity to actually experience Experience the full promise of God because that comes to us in obedience by listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and aligning our life with that through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God's grace, not your grit, that frees you. It's not how hard you work, but it's how much you lean into the work that's been done for you. And that is transformational. But some of us, we've tried to do this on our own for a long time. And what we've experienced is failure over and over and over again. Because all of us have been wounded by living in a broken world. And there are hurts, there are hang-ups, and there are habits that we have developed, that we have entangled our life with, that we meet very legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. All of us have this struggle. So for some of us to be able to walk into the promise God has for us, we need a very, very specific discipleship process. We have that here. On Wednesday nights, there's regeneration. This is a discipleship process that lays out the principles that God has given us to be able to live an abundant life, a fruitful and a fulfilling life that allows us to walk in the victory that is ours. So some of us, the biggest decision you can do to, to, to leave the messy life behind and step into the miraculous life that God has called you to is to block out Wednesday nights and to plan on becoming a part of regeneration. Others, you know, you need to sit down with a counselor, somebody who's been trained to help you untangle from the, the hurts and the wounds Uh, that you're still bruised by, to allow you to be able to forgive and to move forward. And so guess what? We have a counseling center, and that counseling is free of charge for anyone who says, you know, I want to be healed. I want to be whole. I want to be the righteous person that God says I am, and I'm struggling to get there. For others, all you need to do is identify a life group that you can plug into. You know, Larry Crabb says this, it says 70% of all counseling we do wouldn't be needed if we all had a real friend, just someone to talk to. You find that in life groups. Everything that we do here is really done to be a resource for you to walk in the fullness of life that God's called you to. It really isn't about the programs. It's about your provision. It's about helping all of us understand and take hold of the full potential and promise that is ours in Christ so that the world is not robbed of the beauty of God's glory revealed uniquely through you. God says you're a masterpiece. There is no one who can reflect his person exactly like you. Satan wants to steal from the world that glory. And he wants to steal from you the fulfillment and the flourishing that God has planned for you. So you have, to say it in the language of the illustration, the winning ticket. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the power to align with the principles that God has laid out that will deliver for you all of the promise. We just must choose to walk in the newness of life. 
to follow the principles and the precepts that God has laid out for us, which will deliver for us this new life. So the first way God wants to wow us is to have us understand the miracle that we are that you have been made new, that you are transformed, that you are righteous, that you're accepted by God, that you're fully loved, that you are a victor, not a victim, and every struggle you have, God can give you victory over if we choose to walk in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. The second way that God wants to wow us <clears throat> is the ministry that he has called us to. Look at verses 18, 19, and then verse 20 a little bit. It says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God has made you an ambassador. God has placed you in the spaces that you live your life to represent him, to be light and to repel the darkness, to see the world reflect more of his design for it. God is concerned about all things. That means that includes everything that we are a part of. In, first, in Colossians 1, we read this. See how often all things is said in these four verses. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That is, in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. All things matter to God. Every activity that you're involved in each and every day means something to God. God created it to make a contribution to the world, a good contribution. We are, are created to partner with God in making the world a better place and a more beautiful place. And God has given you gifts, talents, and abilities that are uniquely yours to be used in the places and the lives of the people that God has put you in order to see that place and those people flourish. Now, it has always been God's heart to bring healing and health to the world. He said it this way in the Old Testament. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we read these words. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. What does... God mean by wicked ways? You ever asked yourself that? The word in the Hebrew there is raw, and it literally means below par. What God is saying is this. He wants us to look at the world and see it as he intended it to be, and then to evaluate our lives and say, how am I contributing to a reality that is functioning beneath God's intention? God wants us then to turn, to stop doing the things that are contributing to the brokenness and to start doing the things that contribute to the health and the healing of the world and the places and the people that we live. Really what God has done this is he has given us a license to dream. He is saying, look at the world and don't accept it below par. It is wicked, God says, and it's also translated evil other places, for us to see evil and do nothing. To see evil and do nothing is evil. We are to be proactive. God is saying, imagine a world that is functioning as I intended, that is functioning in a healthy, whole way. That is the world he has given us not only a license to dream about, but he has given us the spiritual authority to make those dreams a reality. Yeah. 
God wants you to transform the places he's put you. So that gives you permission to dream, not only about a better life for you, but for your family, for your neighborhood, for your workplace, for the third places, the hobbies, the activities, the passions that you have. God has put you there to make a difference. And we need to stop believing Satan's lies that what we do doesn't matter. It matters drastically. Satan wants to convince us that you can't make a difference in the world. Protect yourself. Huddle. Avoid the brokenness where God says, run to it and I will use you to repose. You are the light of the world. Darkness always is repelled by light. You are a victor, not a victim. We are the people of God that he has promised from the Old Testament to the New that he will work through us to heal the land, to bring health and wholeness, to see heaven revealed through his people, to show the world that there is a better way to live. And that way is lived in right relationship with him, aligned with his principles and precepts. This is where you will flourish. This is when your life will be fruitful and fulfilling. That's God's desire for you, and it comes in our understanding the miracle that we are and the ministry he's given us to change and influence the places he's put us. So how is that done? It's the third way that God wants to wow us, through the message that he has given us. Look at verse 19. It says this, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Here's the amazing truth. God wants you to speak for him. God has given you the gospel, the good news of who he is and what he has done, that we are now saved from our brokenness, rescued from our sin, not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what has been done for us. That's good news. But you know, a whole lot of us, our first reaction when we hear that God wants to speak through us is what? Well, I don't know enough to speak for God. Uh, I probably would do God a better job by just remaining silent, and that's Satan's lie. Because here's the truth. There is something that you know, you know better than anyone else, and you know what that is? That is your story. And there is power in the testimony of how God has transformed and freed you from the, challenge that you, from the challenges that you wrestled with. You want to see the difference that this can make? In Matthew chapter 8, we have the first story of Jesus leaving a Jewish region to minister in. And he encounters a, a demon-possessed man named the demoniac. And after his encounter with this man, Matthew uh, 8 tells us this, And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So Jesus' first visit to this region, he casts demons out of a demon-possessed man. The city comes out and says, We don't understand this. Please leave us. Just a few chapters later, in Matthew 15... Jesus returns to that region for a second time. And it's recorded that the people of the city and towns responded this way. It says that a great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, and the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at, the feet, at his feet, and he healed them all. So let me ask you, what was the difference between Matthew 8 and Matthew 15? What changed? Mark 5 tells us, it says this, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the lobbyists, all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. What was the difference between the people saying, leave us, 
and then bringing all of their sick and their hurting to Jesus. The testimony of one man, his faithfulness of just sharing how God had transformed his life. That changed people's attitude significantly towards Jesus. He didn't have anything but his story. Didn't even have the Holy Spirit at that time. Didn't have an education. But what was he? He was simply obedient to what Jesus had told him to do. Go tell the story. That is the message that God wants to deliver through each of us. He wants us to share how he has changed our lives. And he wants us to live in such a way that 1 Peter 3.15 says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what is God saying this? He says, be ready to tell your story to everyone who asks to hear it. Now let me ask you, when was the last time somebody asked to hear your story? <clears throat> you know, I lived for a long time where that didn't happen very often. And then God kind of showed me a path as to how to turn that and to get people to say, hey, tell me about, tell me about you. And you know what it starts? It starts by being interested in them. And I found as I get to know the people around me, there's, there's a simple question I can ask. It's this. It says, hey, you know, I'd really like to get to know better who you are. Is there some time we could just sit down? I'd like to hear the two or three most significant events or decisions that you've made in your life that has made you or put you where you are today. And then you just listen with interest as they tell you their story. And sometimes it's amazing the things that you hear. They'll talk about how their parents they were divorced as a child and they lived, you know, in foster homes and this and that. Or they'll tell you about moments they made decision to go to school or not go to school. And you begin to see how their life was navigated. And then at the end of that, just say thank you for sharing your story. You know, sometime if you're interested, I'd love to share with you the things that have most impacted my life. And then don't say anything else. Just leave it there. And almost 70% of the time, at some point, they'll come back and say, yeah, you know, I'd love to hear your story sometime. Then you can sit down over coffee, over lunch, and you begin to share. Here's the difference that God's made in my life. And then it's not your job to save them. That's God's job. You know, Neil Cole said this. He said, there's two kinds of people in the world, and he wasn't talking about the with pickle or no pickle person that Steve talked about. He said this. There's two kinds of people in the world. There are moths and cockroaches. And so, what is the difference? Moths fly to the light, and cockroaches run from it. As you hold up your light, God will use you to draw people to him. Not your job to, to wrestle them into the kingdom. Your job to simply share your story. As you share about the miracle of life God's given you. As you share about the ministry God's given you. This is why I love the people around me. This is why I do the kind of work I do. Because of the message. Because Jesus saved me. So how do we get there? Our time's passing. <clears throat> um... Simon Sinek tells a story about transformation, and he says this, and this is an important point. He said, it's not the intensity in which you approach change, it's the consistency in which you approach it. And in our Christian lives, it's not the intensity in which we live our life, it's the consistency in which we live our life for Christ. He tells the story of this. He says, many of us will join gyms first of the year, and we will try to transform ourselves to become healthy. And he says, you can join the gym the first of the year and with all kinds of intensity, go and work out really hard that first day. He says, then you'll go home, you can stand in front of the mirror, you can look at yourself and you can conclude, now, that didn't make a difference. <laughs> and it won't. You can do that for eight days in a row. You can probably do that for a month and you can you know, very easily conclude, you know, that didn't work. Because it's not the intensity, it's the consistency. If you start to work out 
half hour a day, four days a week, and make it a part of your lifestyle, there will come a day when you stand in front of that mirror and you're transformed. You're seeing, this is really making a difference. This is not only true for becoming healthy, it's true for preserving health. Why do we brush our teeth two minutes a day, two times a day? Because we know if we don't invest those two minutes twice a day, our, key, our teeth will decay. If you don't believe me, stop brushing your teeth. An investment of two minutes a day preserves the health of your teeth. An investment of 30 minutes a day, four times a week, keeps you physically fit. You know, the same principles apply to our spiritual lives. You can come to church every Sunday with great intensity and worship God with all your energy and all your strength, but if you leave it there and aren't consistent the rest of the week, it won't produce the transformed life God promised you. Because it is not the intensity, it's the consistency that will transform you. If you will begin to walk in and order your life, to have the life rhythms and spiritual liturgies to include the things God has said are good for us, you will begin to experience the power and the transformation of God in your life. If you choose not to, you'll continue to struggle. You will believe more and experience more the lies of the old man versus the truth of the new. And the choice is yours. So my hope is this year you choose to live consistent with the principles of God's Word so that the power and the promise and the possibilities that God has said are yours begin to be seen in your life. So here's my encouragement for you. I want you to take the 555 challenge, and that's this. I want you, if you're not reading your Bible, to commit to reading your Bible five minutes a day for five days a week for five weeks. And at the end of that time, assess whether or not your life has been made better. And I can almost guarantee you it will be better. And if you're reading your Bible but you're not praying, take that challenge around prayer. Pray five minutes a day, five days a week, for five weeks, and watch God transform you. Now, if you're doing it with Bible reading and prayer, add spiritual conversation. Have five conversations, five days a week, for five weeks, and see how God starts to build a support system around you that will see you strengthened in becoming the body of Christ, the hands and the arms of God in all the places he's put you. So take the 555 challenge. It's not that intensity is wrong, but intensity alone will not produce the consistency that will bring us the transformation. This year, enter it with absolute confidence that you are a new creation, that you are a miracle, that God has called you into ministry that is a part of and actually is the life you live to transform it, and to see all things become aligned with God's intent for them, that they're fulfilling their purpose by sharing the message of your transformation, of God's work in your life, and nobody knows that better than you. Based on the promises of God, not my own word, your life will change you will find the joy. You will begin to flourish. You will see the fruit of the Spirit. You will find the freedom that's yours, and that gives the potential for next year to be the best year of your life. If you're looking for a slogan, you know, it's, you know, be made new in 22. Or we could say, make your dreams come true in 22. Both of those are truths God wants to see be your reality. Because he has given you the, the spiritual authority not to simply dream about a better world, but to create a better world by the spiritual authority and power that he has given you as his ambassadors in the places you live our life. May we see this next year bring transformation to our hearts, homes, neighborhoods, 
workplaces, all the third places that he's put you. If you have had dreams that you have let die or go dormant, may they be resurrected because God wants you to dream of a better world, a world that is functioning as he intended it to, a world where all people benefit because his kingdom has come, whether they accept him for who he is or not. We are there to lift people up by leading and loving like Jesus. Now, if you want to learn more about how to do this, we've written a curriculum in a class that we're going to offer every semester next year. And my hope is that you will join that because it's, it's, it's designed to, live, to see you live the life God's called you to live, to find the fulfillment that God's created you to walk in. My hope is this next year will be the best year that God has ever walked with you through. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the truth of who you are. Thank you, God, for coming and saving us. Lord, for inviting us to minister with you by carrying your message, Lord, the story of our transformed lives to all the people, Lord, that we live alongside each and every day. So, Father, we pray that you would show up, Lord, that you would free us uh, from the messy lives that so many of us have lived, and you would help us step into the miraculous life that you've called us to. Father, I pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So glad that you joined us online today at Houston Northwest Church, where our vision is to make Houston more like heaven by helping Houstonians become more like Jesus. If you have questions about following Jesus or would like to talk to someone about next steps in your spiritual journey, text Know Jesus to 281-946-6500. Connect with us throughout the week by following us on social and enjoy a great day.